risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. This is the day that the Lord has appeared. Let us rejoice and be glad. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, with faith in God's endless mercy and trust in God's boundless love, let us call to mind and confess our sins, first in the silence of our hearts and then together. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sin and whose mercy we forget, cleanse us from all offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that humbly we may draw near to thee, confessing our faults, confiding in thy grace, and finding in thee our refuge and our strength through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
People of God, Christ said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be always with you. You may take your seats. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Easter service at the Memorial Church. I am the Reverend Alana Sullivan. And on behalf of our clergy and staff, let me just share how grateful we are to have you with us this morning. Here at the Memorial Church, we like to say, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you believe, no matter who you love, no matter how you are joining us this morning, whether online, on the radio, or here in our sanctuary, you are most welcome here, and we are so thankful for your presence. If you haven't gotten the memo, today is Easter. That is the day when life, hope, and love have the final say. Our first lesson for today is read by Mira Rose Kingsbury Lee, and the second lesson is read by Lawrence Gia. Our preacher is the Reverend Matthew Ichihashi Potts, Pusey Minister and Plumber Professor of Christian Morals. Our other worship leaders are Reverend Emmanuel Chempong, Reverend Dr. Calvon Jones, Elizabeth Probst, and Steph Grisano. We are also graced this morning by the beautiful music making of our university choir, directed by Edward Jones and assisted by David Von Baron, our assistant choir master. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus shares, let the children come to me, do not stop them, for it is to sure as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. So at this time, we welcome our undergraduate teachers to gather our students who would like to be a part of our church school this morning. During term, we offer church school for children ages three to 14 during worship. If you would like to learn more about connecting with our wonderful church school community, please reach out to Reverend Jones. And if this is your first time joining us, Welcome. We would love to meet you. So please introduce you to any please introduce yourselves to any of the clergy or staff. We offer ministries and programming for Harvard students, staff, faculty, and the wider Cambridge community. I recommend that you look through the bulletin or visit our website to see the variety of our offerings. Our service will now continue with the first lesson. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, beginning at the sixth verse. 
On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Here ends the lesson. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 16, beginning at the first verse. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. 
but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead to you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here ends the lesson. Please stand as you're able to sing the hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hearts to Heaven, number 171. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Happy Easter, everyone. Thank you for joining us and, and celebrating your Easter with us. I wish you had this view. You all look beautiful. This is, a, this is great. Thank you for coming and being part of our celebrations today, sharing your celebration with us. Today, it is, of course, the, the great feast of Easter, the signal feast, the central feast of the church calendar. One of the two big feasts that we preachers preach on every year, Christmas and Easter, right? And among other things, I teach a preaching class here at Harvard. And one of the things I try to relate to my students, some of them are here, uh, don't ask them too closely, but some of the things I try to relate is 
these are stories for humans, human stories, and part of what we were trying to do is relate to these stories at a human level. And on Christmas, that level of human relation, trying to find that, that relation to the story of the birth of Jesus, seeing new life and the story of that birth in a manger, that's easy <laughs> because all of us have seen a baby. Most of us have. <laughs> all of us have been babies. We know babies, the miracle of new life in new life. That is obvious to us. We can relate to that Christmas. Christmas is easy to preach on. Easter, this glorious day, the central feast of our church year, is trickier. All of us have seen babies. Who among us have seen the dead raised? We hear about it once a year. But how do we relate that to our own experience? How do we enter into this? How do we see new life here? So I was thinking about this throughout the week, and especially yesterday, closing in. <laughs> and so I did what I often do when I am stumped by a sermon. Uh, I went to my children to try to get a cute story out of them. And Danny, our 10-year-old, is the one most likely to say something endearingly irreverent. So uh, I, I recruited him to go to Market Basket with me yesterday to go shopping for Easter dinner. And while he was in the car on the drive over, I said to Danny, you know, planting my seeds, Danny, what does Easter mean to you? And Danny responded immediately and helpfully, Easter baskets and candy. <laughs> and so I said, well, Danny, what does that have to do with Jesus? And he thought for a minute and he said, well, Jesus wants us to be happy. <laughs> and Easter baskets make me happy. So there you go, Easter. And so I pressed a little harder because I didn't know if that alone would work for this sermon. And I said, <laughs> so what does that have to do with the story of Jesus, with what happens on Easter morning? And he said, well, his friends went to the tomb and it was empty. And I said, yeah, you're right, they did. How do you think they felt when they got to the tomb and it was empty? And he said, he thought for a second, second, and he said, hmm, I think they probably felt pretty sad. And Mark tells us that they did. As I said, you all look beautiful today, and the church is beautiful, adorned with these lilies. We sound beautiful, the choir. Is magnificent this morning, always, every Sunday, but especially so this morning. And in the midst of all this, of how beautiful you look, how beautiful the church is, the beautiful music around us, what rings through in the gospel passage Larry read is the sense of loss and fear which haunts this morning for these women. They go to the tomb, the tomb is empty, and Danny is right. They're confused. They're afraid. The last word of the gospel passage today is they were afraid. And in fact, that's the last word of the first version of this gospel. They were afraid. It ends with this fear. I believe, and I hope you believe, you're here, I hope you believe that this gospel message is good news, but it doesn't sound like good news yet to these women when they're at the tomb. And not just for these women, but for the first readers of this gospel. Many of you have heard this before, but for visitors here, I can tell you that this gospel was not written a year or two after Jesus died. It was written 40 years after Jesus died. And in fact, it was written in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem. The Romans came in, they crucified thousands. They murdered thousands more. They enslaved thousands. They burned the city to the ground. It was a ruin. The crucified and the dead everywhere, and that's when they wrote down this story, the story they call the good news 
of Jesus Christ and the last word of the gospel is they were afraid. Whatever else this gospel is about, it's about many things. Whatever else it is about, it is at least about disaster or at least about how we respond. This was written as a response to this destruction. And what it offers us, what it aims to offer us is a response to violence and loss. So what is that response? I mean, Jesus gives us a response in the gospel, in the larger narrative of the gospel. We've been reading the gospel of Mark since early December, and we can see this happening throughout the gospel of Mark. In the first half of the gospel of Mark, Jesus is all miracles. He is all power and glory. He can do anything. He does raise the dead, and he calms storms, and he feeds thousands with a loaf of bread, and he heals the sick, He demonstrates the most powerful acts, the most miraculous acts. And so it's no wonder that the people gather around him and they say, this one is the one. Look at his power. Let's follow this power to Jerusalem. The problem is after he starts heading to Jerusalem, he starts shedding all that power. He stops performing all those miracles. He starts telling his friends, the people who accompany him, trusting in his power, he starts telling them that he's going to die suffer and die. And they don't believe it. Why would they? They saw him raise the dead and calm storms and feed thousands. And so when he does suffer, they run away. Most of them, they run away. And they abandon him. What Jesus offers us in the gospel story is not force, but goodness, not violence, but mercy, not conquest, but love. Not war, but peace. The problem is that choice of peace by this Sunday morning has not yielded any magic solutions. The problem is 40 years later, in the ashes of that ruined city, there were still no magic solutions. The choice of peace still offered no magic solutions. So what do we do? The world around us, edging towards, maybe careening towards disaster, what do we do? Look what these women do. These brave women on Easter morning, they, in fact, respond just like Jesus in their way. They have been surrounded by violence and loss, and they respond with love. They go to the tomb to care for their friend. But it's a certain kind of love they respond with. It's a love that is without expectation. It's important to say, important for us to remember, especially as disaster lurks all around us in this world. It's important to say that these women did not know what would happen when they went to that tomb. They didn't even know what they would do when they got there. The stone was too heavy for them to move. What they embark upon, the task they embark upon this morning, going to the tomb to care for the body of their beloved friend, it is impossible on its face. The stone was too heavy. It is useless at best, anointing a person for burial who is already buried. It was dangerous at worst, the people who killed him still lurking around, guarding that tomb. And they did not know, they could not have known what their love would find when they went, when they went. And as our gospel passage ends this morning, they still don't know what they have found. The point, though, is they went to the tomb not knowing. They went to the tomb ready to love him, regardless of its impossibility or its usefulness or its danger. They didn't know what would happen, but I think this means that Easter is not about knowing 
what will happen, or even what did happen at that empty tomb. Easter is not about knowing exactly what this resurrected life looks like or means, who of us has seen the dead risen firsthand. Easter is not about an outcome of which we are certain. It's about a love which endures even the worst outcomes. Easter is not about knowledge. It's about courage. And here, I think, is where the story gets relatable. Where the kind of courage that can love, even through bad outcomes, is something each of us knows in our own life. At the nine o'clock service this morning, we had a baptism. Who is more courageous than a young parent who brings a child into the world, who wants to protect it from everything, who would do everything and anything in their power to protect that child, but also every day knows that they cannot, at the last, protect that child from everything. They embark upon that task of love not because they know what that child's life will be, but because the child deserves to be loved. Whatever happens. Think about the other things that we call sacramental rites or sacraments in the church. Think of marriage. When people stand together and get married, they don't say to each other, I know exactly how this is going to go, and that's why this is happening. <laughs> they say, for better, for worse, for richer and poorer, I don't know. But I love you. And so we will embark upon this together. All of us lose people we love. And sometimes we knew, do know how it's going to end. We're told exactly when our loved ones will die. We do know the outcome. But knowing that our loved ones are dying doesn't make us love them less. It makes us love them more with all our hearts because we, in those moments, have the courage to love even lost causes. This is where it becomes relatable. We, each of us, knows the courage of that kind of love, knows that love has that kind of courage. And if we know it in our personal lives, we can also scale it and make it political, as I believe Christ would want us to do. Think of justice in this country racial justice in this country, the unrealized dream of racial justice in this country, or gender justice, or economic justice. Think of how fragile those dreams are today. Think about democracy in this country and how fragile it seems. What's going to happen with these dreams of justice that we have? Will they be realized? I don't know. Are these lost causes? I hope not. But whether they are or not, those who suffer injustice in this country deserve all our love and our energy. So love them more, not less. Think of peace in this world. Intractable hatred and violence and especially so this morning in, in the land of Jesus' birth and death and resurrection. Will there be peace in the Holy Land? Is that a lost cause? I hope not, but I don't know. But whether it is or not, the starved and the bombed and the hostage people in the Holy Land deserve all our love and energy. So let's love them more, not less. Think of climate change, the carbon already in our atmosphere, the destruction that will come unless we change. Is this a lost cause? Is there hope? I don't know. 
but endangered species and endangered habitats and vulnerable communities. All of them deserve our love and our energy, so love them more, not less. We don't know. We don't know anything more than that these things deserve and merit our love, and so we must give it to them. We must have courage. Now, I am not naive, or at least I hope I am not naive. This recommendation, this gospel message of love, it is not a prescription for miracles. I don't believe it is. We could love just as much as I have asked us to do, as much as I believe the gospel asks us to do, and we may still find justice to be elusive. War may still persist. The carbon may still remain in our atmosphere. We need love, but we need science and economics and diplomacy too. And I am not a scientist or an economist or a politician. But the women who went to Jesus' tomb this morning didn't know about economics or policy or climate science. They didn't even know that Jesus would be risen. They didn't go because they had found the answer. They didn't even go looking for an answer. They went because they loved their friend. And death would not and could not change that fact. It would not and could not change the fact that they would live their lives in that love. Easter, the good news of Easter, is not about knowledge, I don't think. It's about courage, about the courage to love. Our world, as I suggested, is troubled. It abounds with suffering. If we're honest, it is full of people and places and causes that do seem lost and hopeless at times, and it is frightening to think about. No wonder our gospel passage ends in fear. It is frightening. But take courage. There is more to the story. Although this gospel ends saying that the women were too afraid to tell anybody anything, they told somebody. We're all here. Word got out. If we learn anything from Mary Magdalene and Mary and Salome, these brave women today, what we learn is that emptiness is not the same as and is no reason for despair. If we learn anything from the Easter message from this good news, it is that there is no cause so lost we cannot still give our hearts to it, our hearts and our lives. So as you depart this church today, as you go out into the world for which Christ died, Choose a good cause. Give yourself to it. Even if, even when all seems lost, take courage, take heart, and take the hands of those who are willing to walk with you. And then set off bravely towards all those empty tombs giving your lives to one another and to love. I invite you please to rise and join me in saying the summary of law to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Please be seated. As we come before our Creator God, 
in thanksgiving and petition this Easter Sunday. I invite the congregation to respond. Hear our prayer when I say, Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord God, for this Resurrection Sunday and the empty tomb, for the gift of salvation and eternal life. Jesus mentioned that in this world we will have trouble, but that he has overcome the world. We thank you for our families and loved ones for bringing us this far. We pray for the sick, the poor, the lonely, for those mourning, for those who have given up on life, and many others waiting on you for their breakthrough. For you are a God of love and hope. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our Harvard community. These past six months have been turbulent. We pray for our university leaders, faculty, staff, and students. We pray for healing as a community and that God's peace and understanding that surpasses human understanding will be upon our university. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our nation, our president, our members of Congress, state and city leadership, for the wisdom of God in the conduct of our affairs. Help us overcome our divisive politics and the aggression that has entered our politics this election year, that we will learn to put the nation first and rise above partisan politics. We pray for the key bridge collapse in Baltimore and the lives lost, the extensive damage, the fragility of life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for conflict areas around the world, the war in Gaza, for the release of the Israeli hostages, the Russia-Ukraine war, Sudan, Myanmar, and many other conflicts that have faded from our public attention, but that continue to claim and disrupt lives. This Easter Sunday, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for the Jews, Christians, and Muslims that share the sacred city. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our warming earth. The year 2023 was the warmest year on record since global records began in 1850, with 2014 to 2023 being the warmest decade. We see the effects all around the world in extreme weather patterns. Lord, help us change our lifestyles. Teach us to be better custodians of this wonderful earth. Lord, heal your earth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We will continue in a moment with the service of Holy Communion. Please know that here at the Memorial Church, all are welcome to receive communion. Our wafers are gluten-free. You may receive either just the bread alone or bread and wine. If you do choose to receive wine, please dip your wafer into the cup instead of sipping from the cup. Please dip your wafer. If you'd like communion brought to you where you sit, uh, where you sit, please alert an usher. There will be a couple of stations up front and a couple of stations in back. Just follow the directions of your ushers to know which station to proceed to. If you'd like not to receive communion but would like to receive a blessing, you're also welcome to come forward and we will bless you however you desire to join us in fellowship at this table. You are welcome at this table and we hope that you will join us. Our offering, our Easter offering this week, goes to support the work of this church, especially our ministries to students and to our neighbors in need through the Grants Committee. If you prefer to donate online, there is a QR code on the envelope in your pews, and you can do donate that way. The collection will begin in just a moment at the front of the sanctuary, 
Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift down to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. God of life and love, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us caring for the sick and blessing the poor. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. 
And so this day we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. The same night that he was betrayed, Jesus sat at table with his friends. He took bread and gave thanks to you, O God. And then he broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you. And then he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind Jesus' death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, and rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and of wine may be to us the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share this bread and cup may work together for the day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen over all this earth. Look, favor, look with favor on all your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast forever at your heavenly table. All this we ask through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O loving God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God.
you please to rise for our post communion prayer? Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. For the final blessing, if you'd indulge me for just a couple of quick announcements. First, after the service, we have all these beautiful lilies. If you would like to take a lily home, uh, they'll be available after the service. I think people will be come this way in a civil manner. Come, come, <laughs> come, come this way. Uh, and they will be distributed fairly and in time if you uh, have some patience. Um, the other announcement I have for this morning is just I, I must express my deep and sincere thanks to all the people who have made all our services this Holy Week so holy and so beautiful. Um, really, since Palm Sunday last Sunday, of course, every Sunday, but since Palm Sunday, all our services this week have been, have been uh, real, real blessings to me and to this community, and it's because of the hard work of so many people. So to our musicians, to the choir, and uh, yeah, applause, please. To Ed and David and Carson and Frank and all our choristers and to our musical company, uh, com accompanists, uh, uh, Jen and Sarah, who can I, I can see and I can't see that. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you so much um, for all you've done to make it such a, a wonderful celebration. Uh, to the staff of this church who has done so much, especially people who got up very early this morning, Teresa and, and Jesus for our, um, our sunrise service, but all the staff of this church who work so hard, to our, our clergy and seminarians who have been at so many services this week. We are so grateful uh, to you all for all you do. And thank you to all of you for sharing your Easter with us this morning and joining us here in Memorial Church and being part of our community. One more offer of thanks I need to give uh, for a particular staff member. Elizabeth Montgomery has been a part of this church for 18 years, more than a part of the church, the beating heart of this church. For 18 years, she is a beloved member of this staff, an integral member of this staff. For happy reasons, she is moving with her family to, uh, to Illinois, and today is her last Sunday with us. She'll be working remotely for a bit longer, but um, this is the last time we'll have her with us on Sunday morning. And although our hearts are breaking, it is Easter, and we know there is new life. And she goes with all our blessings and all our love, and uh, she better come back to visit us sometime soon. <laughs> so can we give Elizabeth a round of applause for her years of service? <laughs> Elizabeth, on behalf of three other PUC ministers whom you have served, we are so grateful. Uh, and we, we wish you all good things as you go. And now for the blessing. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his grace. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from death to newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to death into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. And may the blessing of God Almighty, our Maker, our Redeemer, and our constant companion, may that be with you this day and every day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us sing the closing hymn together, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son, number 174. <laughs>